Hello, and welcome to my presentation on Domain-Driven Platform Engineering. I'm sure all of you are familiar with the concepts and principles of platform engineering. Being a cube day, I'm sure you are actually doing some of this work. But uh, one of the things that I want to actually differentiate today is to take some of those engineering principles that you have been thinking about within the platforms and start applying that to your business domains. My name is Ajay Chakramath. I work for a company called Brilio. And Brilio is a company that has been doing digital transformation for the past several years. And uh, you know we have been applying some of the key platform engineering principles and applying Gen AI with it. With that said, let's just took, take a look at the problem statement as a whole. Any company in any industry are really going to be looking at three specific things, right? You want to improve your customer experience. You want to boost your revenues as well as reduce your operational costs. Depending on the industry that you are in, you might find that you might be interpreting and articulating some of these, these three things in slightly different ways. And that's okay, right? Because it all sort of falls under these three categories. But how do you do that? And there are four different things that you should be thinking about, right? One is like, how do you actually create that repeatability within your process so that you don't really have to reinvent the wheel every time for every team and every kind of problem that you have? The other part of it is, as you create your solutions, how composable are they? Are you going to be wedded to a particular technology or a vendor <clears throat> to be able to solve this problem? Third part is like, are you unlocking some of the you know, requirements that are needed for rapid scaling uh, so that you can actually increase your customers? And then the last part is probably the most important thing. If you can't measure what you're doing, you can't probably improve that. So obviously measurable improvements are key. With that said, uh, my, the outline of my discussion today is going to be based on uh, the following items. So we'll start with some of the platform thinking principles. Then we'll talk about platform products, uh, and then I'll sort of move into those building the domain platforms. I'll define what the domain platforms are. I'll take some examples. Then we'll talk a little bit about the value realization itself. And finally, I'll sort of, uh, sort of introduce you to this concept of abstraction shift where you can really have it you know, use this technique to actually try and apply some of the platform engineering principles to your business domains. So let's talk about the platform engineering principles themselves, right? So we all have seen this multiple times, but just to recap, right? So platform is a product. I don't have to actually talk about the virtues of platform as a product to all of you, but the idea is that if you have that as a product as opposed to just a, just a set of automation or scripts or tools, it becomes far more uh, impactful in the long run. So the other part is that you need to have your product observable. So I'm talking about your platform product being observable, not what the platform product is trying to build. Then you need to actually create a collaborative approach to doing this. So platform thinking has got a lot to do with the culture of doing things. So it has to be very collaborative. And we already talked a little bit about composability and replaceability. And obviously you need to have your systems being a lot more secure and compliant. And at the same time, some things that we tend to forget, you know, some, some you know, is the whole idea of self-serve, right? If you have a platform engineering team, we have talked about a lot in the past, and even at this conference, there are a lot of um, conversations that's happening around this. Making sure that your platform is self-serve is going to be the real differentiator between an old way of doing things and what's new. And then what the developers need are things like paved roads. If it is self-serve and if it if they have a paved road that they can take, if they have like reference architectures that they can fall back on, the whole idea of adopting platforms become far more easier. So what's the value prop? You know, as you really look at your platform products, uh, I would look at value proposition in three different axes. The first axis is this organizational value. Right? How much of the values that unlock it for the whole organization? Would this be on the developer community engagement? Would this be to empower teams? So there are a lot of things within that space. The other part is the other axis is your system value. You know, so are you creating a composable architecture? You know, would you be able to ensure some compliance within this process? And are you able to enable the agility overall? And the last one, uh, last plane there is what you see up top is the developer plane. And this is the one that is getting a lot of attention these days, right? You're really talking about how do you manage the cognitive load using platform engineering products? Would you actually take it, take, make sure that your developers don't have to learn new things every day to be able to be more productive? And if you're making them um, do these things by themselves using self-serve capabilities, this is yet another thing that you have to really think about. And once you do that, it becomes far more easier for the developers to, to experiment with ideas and increase their productivity in the long run. So with this as the value prop, now let's look at how do you actually move your engineering measures that we spoke about so far to your business outcomes. 
none of those engineering measures matter until it actually has an impact on your business. So the idea here is fairly simple. You start asking like, how are you delivering value? What are you doing on the engineering side of things? Are you able to deliver the right kind of value? Are you able to reduce that friction, the friction between teams and be between your products and the customers using it, between your sales teams and your operations teams, and between your engineering teams and every other team, right? Or, so you have to really start thinking about how do you minimize those costs, ensure those handoffs, and start streamlining the development process. The next thing to think about is hiding the complexity. And so some of these things can become very, very complex. You know, we don't really the, you know, program in complex assembly language anymore, right? I mean, we actually use uh, far more easier ways to do things. So the idea is, can we actually hide that complexity to the level in which you can really simplify your interfaces and boundaries? And the last part is something that you can't really overemphasize on. It is the idea of learning rapidly, right? How do you increase that quick learning? There are so many things to learn. How do you make sure that that level of cognitive load is something that can be um, assumed by the developers to be able to do some of these things? So now let's start de uh, defining what those domain capability platforms are. So from my point of view, there are lots of different, if look at your business and look at the industry that you are in, and that is your domain capability platform. But the purpose of discussion today, we'll sort of um, split these domain capability platforms into five. You know, the first one is the BFSI. Uh, the second one is healthcare and life sciences. The third one is technology and telecom. Uh, and the fourth one, and you might call that as a communication media technology. Um, next one we'll look at is automotive and manufacturing. And then finally, the retail and CPG. Uh, these are just uh, a set of uh, capability platforms. Depending on your industry, depending on the work that you're doing, you might actually have a slightly different set of industry vertical that you align to. Uh, a good example is a higher ed. And I didn't explicitly call things like higher ed here. They might have uh, some very common capability platforms that you could build between these and things like higher ed. So uh, with this said, let's actually start with, um, you know, start by looking into this in a little bit more detail. So if you really want to start building the business capabilities at a high level, what you're really going to do, right? So why and what of what you need to achieve is you see a strategy, then how do you actually want to do it is that execution. If you can combine these two, if you can merge these things, this is where those business capabilities gets built. Keep that in mind as we go through the rest of this. So first thing to think, go back to our original conversation on business value realization. How are we actually doing this across different uh, axes? So at the bottom most layer, what you're really looking at is that are you bringing in your technology and systems and modern AI techniques and data to ensure that customer experience and you know, uh, developer experience as well as the overall culture of working together is in there. And if you're doing that, automatically you are positioning yourself to have a better operational efficiency and ability to scale your revenues uh, and customers rapidly. And this is not just theory, right? I mean, so if you really look at a lot of the studies that is happening today and you have you can see some references there, is that if you actually have your productivity improvements as, as metrics, you know, and using platforms, um, you are probably going to be saving significantly in that, that uh, space. And time to market increases drastically because you have no proven solutions within that space. Scalability is something that everybody struggles with. Uh, if you don't have the right kind of ecosystem to make it happen. So we have the data that says that this actually helps, platform actually helps scalability by 60%. And the customer satisfaction, right? I mean, that is um, that also increases significantly. Now you might ask that, yeah, customer satisfaction number, that isn't as high as I would want it to be. That's not really the point, right? The point is like, can you actually scale uh, your products and increase your number of customers at least by keeping your customer satisfaction at the same level as in which you would have it. And in this case, you're saying that even your customer satisfaction increases. So by the time you are actually apply the scalability and the productivity aspects to it, you are definitely improving uh, your ability to make more revenues and reduce your operational costs. So as you go from engineering to business platforms, and you know, this is how I typically look at it. Um, the idea is that platform engineering is the foundation layer, what we spoke about. Um, and on top of that is what you really build, your product experience side of things. This is where you really start looking at your product conceptualization, ideation, the product analytics, the, the overall product lifecycle management. And then you'd start doing your architecture and technology governance and things like that on top of it. Then 
Once you do that, you are now ready to actually make sure that you can actually start building some of the domain platforms. So these domain platforms are the things that we spoke about earlier, whether it is specifically to an industry domain. Are you creating things that are more API first and abstracted out ways of doing it? Are you applying domain driven designs and you know, MFEs and microservices and all that? And then the overall industry specific ranks are something that is getting a lot of attention right now because your LLMs can only handle whatever um, the, the default LLM you know, requirements are. But beyond that, are you able to apply your context sensitive ranks to make sure that there is higher value there? Now, uh, your business product management aspect of it is just as important as your technical product management. So you see that the technical product management is one of the core to platform engineering. So you need to have a specific business product management that, that is needed for the domain platforms. Now, let's look at that product management a little bit because I, I am a big believer in having the right product management skills that is the absolute necessity for making this successful. So in the business domain product management, one of the things you can, you're going to see is that it is really focused on those external customers and relies on engineering team for the technology, right? Whereas the, the platform product manager or the technical product manager is going to be focused on the technology side of things and focused on the internal customers and understanding various um, aspects like, you know, what, how, how are we using the public cloud and how are you using some of the DevOps principles and platform engineering capabilities and all that. Now, if you were to look at the overall platform product ecosystem, I would, temp I would be tempted to actually uh, split that into five different categories. Again, keeping the experiences, experience layer outside of it, what you're going to start with is the bottom part that you see there. So the core platform services is where you are actually starting to build in things like your developer experience layer, your integration layer, your core services, and the infrastructure. This is what we typically call as most of the platform engineering space. But beyond that, there are a few things that you should be considering, like how about the cross-functional services? Where do you do the kind of workflow automation that you want to do? How do you actually apply AI and ML? And the experience services there uh, would be more along the lines of your system dashboards and self-service portals. So these are the experiences that are more from the point of view of usability of the internal experiences. So what you see on the left side there is the experience services is those external customer specific, you know, your third party customer specific experiences. Now let's look at plane four, which is the compliance part of it. So your security controls and policy management within this whole space. Uh, are some, sometimes going to be part of your core platform services, sometimes going to be part of domain-specific services. So it's important to sort of call that out as a separate category. Now, let's look at that top level, which is the domain-specific services. So within there, you, and again, we're going back to this example, so five different domains. As you can see, there are some very specific capabilities that you can build within each of those domains that will make it powerful enough and abstracted out enough that, that you'll be able to start seeing the benefits of applying the platform engineering to specific domains. Now, you know, going, to, going into each of them in a little bit more detail, uh, you had, if you were to actually look at all the foundational services that we spoke about earlier, which is the core platform services side of things, and then go into the, the, the domain specific activities, which is like core, and especially in BFSI space, it'll be things like your banking services, your risk management, financial data, and things like that, as well as things like your customer experience in Omnichannel and Omnichannel support. So these things would sort of encompass the whole financial services domain. So if you were to apply AI, as I was talking about earlier, how would this look? So there are three things to think about there. You know, are you going to get some AI-driven insights? Are you able to do some predictive analytics or are you able to do some ML automation? Within BFSA domain, you can do all of these three things, you know, using some of the technologies that you're seeing right now. And this will have a clear impact on your platform engineering improvements. So this is where you'd be able to start seeing some, you know, secure and scalable infrastructure. And, um, you know, this is for running all, all your AI and ML models, as well as applying CI, CD to automate your model deployments and, you know, enabling that observability. So you can see that core foundational platform engineering capabilities are obviously needed for applying the AI, but this is something that will be super helpful as you really look at your BFSI domain as a whole. Similarly, let's look at the CPG domain. So here you're seeing that some of the key requirements that you have within the space of um, business domains as you do your domain driven design is that you probably have needs of doing your inventory management, your order management and point of sales and things like that. 
So while the specifics of the capabilities that you build within the CPG domain would be very different from something you might do in, in a BFSI, you can see that there are key abstract capabilities that you can abstract out and call it out as a modularized solution. Similarly, you know, if you are driving the AI impact in the CPG domains, you know, look at it from the point of view of those three axes we spoke about earlier, AI-driven insights and predictive analytics and ML automation. If you take those things, you have the ability to do far more rapid customization of your customer experience. And your self-serve for faster iteration and turnaround for personalization is absolutely needed. And uh, you know, these days, with the ideas of having providing better support, you're going to have some API-driven ways of doing the chatbots and improving that. <clears throat> Now, going into the manufacturing domain, you can again see a, a similar set of activities, but different uh, from the point of view of how do you actually do your CRM? How do you actually manage your supply chain? How do you set up your manufacturing execution system? So looking at some of those very specific capabilities, you can see this model is repeating itself over and over and over again. <clears throat> Similarly, apply the AI uh, aspects to this manufacturing domains. As you look at this, you would find that you are able to apply some of those platform training principles to abstract out some of those really complex IoT device management. And, and these are some things that we are already seeing in some of the manufacturing fields. So as we as we at Brilio work with a lot of different clients, one thing that one area that we are seeing significant improvements in some of the you know, Gen AI principles using platform techniques is within the manufacturing space. So you can, there are so many things that you can do with respect to having more centralized monitoring and control planes. And you, know, you can also have some domain specific platform services that accelerate that integration with AI itself, you know, within the manufacturing engineering services. So the impact of AI and, and the platform engineering here is also becoming highly, um, you know, differentiated. Now let's look at the HCLS domain. In healthcare and life sciences, some of your requirements are different. You know, you're, you know, there are a lot of, uh, conversations happening today with respect to EHR, uh, some of the healthcare analytics and the clin clinical decision support areas. So the kind of capabilities that you can come up with in the space is probably far more today and far more impactful than any of the other domains. But having said that, this is something that is probably still fairly nascent in its evolution. Again, applying your um, AI uh, aspects to these things. You can see that um, EHR integration with AI ML models uh, provides significant inter interoperability. And you know, within the healthcare standards, you, know, you definitely need to have a lot more secu security and compliance. So that, that can be applied through platform engineering. And the real-time observability becomes far more important for something like this. <clears throat> within CMT, um, you know, with your communication media technology domain, <clears throat> the kind of requirements are again different, right? So people, not every organization really look at these things in all under one domain, but for the, the, the sake of conversation, I'm actually going to look at this all, all together. So here there are things like, you know, in a, on, on one end of the spectrum, you have things like your network security. On the other end of the spectrum, you have things like your digital rights management, right? So in between that, you could think of it like streaming and playback and whether it is IoT device management. There's so many different unique domain capabilities that you can build here. And the AI impact continues to be significantly high within this domain too, right? That's the ability to you know, deploy seamlessly. Having those multi-cloud deployments, this is happening a lot more within CMT. The multi-cloud is happening far more within CMT compared to every other industry. And some of the aspects of automated intra-provisioning, scaling, and cost efficiency is also highly pre prevalent in this case. Now, as you really start looking at all these industry verticals, what is starting to jump out there, if you were to go back to some of the previous slides, and now what's starting to jump back there is that there is like that spectrum of things happening where you're having, at one end, you have this high abstraction and low domain centricity. These are your foundational services we spoke about. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have this low abstraction and high domain centricity. What does that mean? So that means that as you really start abstracting out the capabilities in such a way that your developers don't have to learn a lot more and you can actually make it repeatable and make it a more platform driven capability, the next step along the process from foundational services is to really look at your common enterprise services. If you look at each of the domains earlier, you would find that there are a lot of common things that are jumping out 
even though they are not considered to be a typical platform engineering activity. This would be your CRM, your inventory management, and SEM. A lot of the domains would have similar requirements with respect to warehouse management. How specifically you might do it, how the developers would use that capability and what kind of data goes in and comes out, that could be different, but the capabilities and the functions and the workflows would be very similar. Now, going beyond the, the common enterprise services is that more exciting aspect of those domain backbone services, right? These are things like your payment processing. You're going to be doing your payment processing, whether you are in the CPG uh, in our domain or whether you are in the healthcare domain or in the financial services domain, right? I mean, but how you might do it might be slightly different, but having those as a abstracted out capability makes it far more interesting. Now, comes the whole idea of those unique domain services. So that's where your capabilities become high, you know, highly domain-centric and has got the lowest level of abstraction. If you look at it that way, you find that, okay, that's where my developers would have to put in, the top layer is where my developers would have to put in most effort to get the most bang for the buck. But if you can really start shifting that abstraction layer from foundations to common enterprise services to domain backbone services, that unique domain services would stand out. Today, I would say that a lot of the work within platform engineering space happened within the space, because as we really move ahead, we are seeing that these two layers are really catching up, and that is making sure that your developers can actually get the done th get things faster and with higher quality. So let's look at, look at a quick um, case study for abstraction shift, right? I mean, so what we're going to look at is an intelligent financial services platform. So the idea is that we're building a scalable four-layer approach for modernizing BFSI platforms on AWS. As you look through this, the first thing on the foundational services, think of that bottommost layer, you're provisioning infrastructure, you're configuring your security policies and setting up your monitoring and observability, and then setting up your DR and you know, backup and all that. So all the technologies that explicitly called out here in this case study are things that we're familiar with. You know, These are things that you typically do as part of your platform engineering activity. Now, if you really go up that abstraction layer, you know, let's start building this common enterprise services. So you're trying to do things like your identity management or setting up your data lake and, and making sure that your pipelines are enabled. So there are things like that that you typically do that are that are going to use those foundation layer capabilities, meaning like you're not really going to be building this as the uh, from from in a, in a bespoke manner. You're really going to be using those capabilities that you build in the foundation layer or your cloud native services. As you do that, you can see that these are problems that you typically solve today, but you may not be looking at this problem in, in such a way that it is sort of abstract doubt and provided as a capability. Now, the domain backbone services, you know, so this is where that core banking integration would happen, the BFSI space or some kind of a fraud detection setup would happen. So this is, as you can see, becoming a little bit more closer to that domain specific activity as opposed to that lower in a, in a high, higher abstraction. So you are really going to be you know, using some of the key technologies within the space to make sure that you can actually build these domain backbone services. Now comes the, the interesting part, right? Your most bespoke set of solutions, which is your unique domain services. This is the place where you would be doing things like you know, some kind of personalized financial services deployment or some kind of a robo-advisor where this advisor um, are for you know some of the financial activities or something else, doesn't matter. I mean, so you can have some advanced fraud analytics. So there are lots of very specific things. I've called out a lot of things from the financial service industry in this one, just to show the range of uh, activities that you might do, but you could probably do the same thing in, within any industry, you know, any of those industry verticals or domains to see how you might actually be building some of those solutions. So the reason I actually showed this case study was to ensure that you understand that the work with, that happens within each of these planes are going to be highly technology focused with a domain centricity, right? I mean, so that the domain centricity sort of increases when you go from the bottommost layer to the topmost layer. Now you have all of those things. So you you build you you know what to do. You have actually you know created the set of different sets of uh, functionalities to build, capabilities to build. Now the question is, how do you go about doing it? How do you prioritize that? What's the way in which you should do that? What I would recommend is for you to really start doing a two by two approach. I'm sure you'd have done a lot of two by twos for things like value complexity mapping and things like that. In this case, what we are really mapping here is on the x-axis, we are looking at the abstraction layer, the y-axis, we are looking at the domain centricity. So if you really look at it from that point, if you where you really want to start from is your bottom right. 
So with bottom right is going to be most of your high abstraction, low domain specific activities. Then you might really want to move into high abstraction and domain specific activities, right? So this is why it's numbered this way. Then after that, you move into those low abstraction and high, very specific to domain. But what you really are going to be, you know, be thinking about when you get into low abstraction, low domain centricity is the fact that um, do you really want to be doing those things yourself or would you rather, you know, buy those, some of those solutions? That's true across the board for each of these quadrants. But when it comes to that bottom left, that is a question that you really have to ask, like, is that something that you want to do, right? So as you really go through this, this gives you a really good prioritization manner so that these things are not abstract in itself, you know, and, and you can really come up with a roadmap to actually build some of these solutions. So the takeaways here is that as you go from your platform engineering space to that you know, more domain expertise activities, things to think about are, you know, are you creating more modular and composable architecture? Are you creating that API for services? And the core of everything is, can you do that more of that domain-driven design? And then if your interoperability and open standards are going to be the ones that are going to ensure that you, your domain-specific activities can be done effectively, are you able to do that? And not to reduce importance of AI-driven and domain drags, because if you don't have those domain racks, you're really not going to be able to accelerate the level in which you want to do that. With that said, uh, I want to thank you all for listening to this presentation. Uh, if you want to stay connected, feel free to reach out to me over email or LinkedIn or check out my website. Uh, if you want to connect with me over LinkedIn, you know, use the QR code. And um, I thank you so much for listening to me, listening to me today. And uh, hope we, hopefully we can stay connected. Appreciate it.